As I'm sure most of you know by now, the Artemis launch got scrubbed yet again on Saturday, and this time it looks like it might take a while, like over a month, for them to recycle and reset and try to launch again. Does that mean that Artemis is doomed or not? Plus, Tesla sales swell, GM looks like they might finally be getting the hint, and Teslas save lives, including their glass roofs. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So I'm gonna start with this CBS article. The NASA Starcross Space Launch System moon rocket was grounded for the second time in five days on Saturday, this time by a large hydrogen leak in a fuel line quick disconnect fitting that will delay the $4.1 billion booster's maiden flight by several weeks, likely into October. So yeah, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Very, very disappointing. I had actually considered very strongly going down this Saturday to watch the launch myself. In retrospect, I'm kind of glad I didn't do the 14 hours of driving just to be disappointed. It's not like it even got very close. It was, I think, two or three hours away from launch when they scrubbed it. So it never even got particularly close to the actual launch time. The more important news here is that SLS or Artemis or whatever you want to call it is delayed yet again. And this increases costs and also increases the doubt that NASA, the U.S. government, the U.S. taxpayers, etc., have about this rocket. This is something that's supposed to take us back to the moon. And obviously, we're supposed to end up with the lunar landing system that SpaceX is developing, the gigantic lunar starship. And of course, this rocket has been delayed over and over and over again. So people really want to see it launch. I'm sure no one more than the NASA officials in charge and the developers of the rockets. You again, look at this rocket and it looks kind of just like a cobbled together Apollo slash space shuttle that's been stuffed together with the solid rocket boosters, the orange fuel tank and Apollo S capsule on top. It doesn't look like it's that much new technology, but apparently quite a bit of it is. But I, for one, find it difficult to believe that a rocket like this that really is literally built out of old spare parts. I mean, the RS-25 engines at the bottom are literally from space shuttles. They all flew on space shuttles. And it's kind of actually tragic to see that they're going to end up being dumped into the ocean after they're used up and they won't get to fly again. But anyway, you know, none of this stuff is really new technology except potentially the capsule. And the capsule flew, what was it, in 2013 or 2014? It was ages ago. So that thing flew. It did fantastic. That thing's been ready for a decade, basically. So none of the stuff that's complicated or new is the things that are holding this back. This is all just bureaucracy bureaucracy, cost overruns, doing cost plus contracts, doing things in a way that really aren't efficient in the modern world. They worked really, really well for NASA in the 1960s and kind of okay for NASA in the 1980s with the space shuttle. But nowadays, really cost plus types of contracts that are spread all over the country, just not the way to go anymore. Obviously, SpaceX shows how you should be doing it. They're much more agile. They're able to develop things in-house. They're able to move much more rapidly than this. And of course, with Elon Musk's Tesla as well, showing the automobile market how they're supposed to be operating. This is kind of an embarrassment for all of the parties involved, including NASA. It probably at this point, what they need to do is get out of building and launching rocket ships. They need to just contract that out to private contractors, and they need to think about science payloads, doing things that are not particularly profitable, potentially, like exploring other planets or things like that. And so they need to be thinking more about being the payload for these rockets rather than developing the rockets themselves. Anyway, in the near term, Artemis 1, 2, and 3 certainly will launch. But as Jordan, the angry astronaut, has talked about before, they need a new mobile launch tower in order to do Artemis 4. And the odds that that's actually going to be built or even funded at this point are starting to become less and less apparent. I wanted to add a little addendum to the discussion about the SLS or Artemis, because right after I finished filming the original video, Elon Musk, of course, had to tweet about this. So I figured I should add his thoughts at this point. Anyway, responding to a tweet by Eric Berger, Elon Musk said, accurate assessment in terms of the hydrogen issues. Raptor design started out using H2, but switched to CH4, which is methane, by the way. Ladder is best combo of high efficiency and ease of operation, in my opinion. Delta V difference between H2 and CH4 is small for most missions because CH4 tank is much smaller and no insulation is needed. And by the by, one of the reasons why Artemis's fuel tank 
the orange thing is so darn extended is because it uses hydrogen. Hydrogen is very undense and it takes a huge amount of volume to store it all. Plus as the least dense element, basically just a proton and an electron, it also wants to escape from everything and react with everything. And of course, in order to store hydrogen as a liquid, you have to freeze it down to within a couple of degrees of absolute zero. So it's a real beast to deal with. And a few minutes later, Zapex said also CH4 or methane is easier to produce on Mars. And Elon Musk responded, yes, this is also very important. Now, of course, the whole Mars thing is not that important to Artemis at this point, but in the future, it is going to be incredibly difficult to manufacture hydrogen on Mars. And if you consider how difficult it is to deal with hydrogen on Earth right now with all of the support equipment, we have, you can imagine it would be almost impossible to deal with it on Mars. So we may get a couple of astronauts boots on the ground with Artemis 3, but that may be it for this program. I honestly hope that's not the case, but if it is, I also hope that SpaceX's Starship and Super Heavy Booster program progress as quickly as they can so that we can at least have some American company that's producing rocket ships that are able to take people to the moon and then eventually Mars. Speaking of Tesla, I wanted to touch really quickly on this article that William Johnson wrote yesterday as I record this about how Tesla sales are estimated to have grown 105% year over year, which puts them way out in the lead of any auto manufacturer, not just EV manufacturers, but auto manufacturers overall. And if you look down here at this chart, the year over year percent change, you can see like BMW negative 0.2, Daimler 40% increase, Ford 27. And remember last year was a really weird year with the chip shortage coming off the pandemic and everything. So a lot of companies are going to grow relative to last year. It's not so good to see like Honda is negative 41% not good at all. But anyway, nobody is even close to touching Tesla in terms of their growth rate. So I just wanted to look at this really quickly. I think it's a really interesting chart and it also indicates just how rapidly Tesla is taking over. People, including me, are just starting to see Teslas everywhere. When we bought our Tesla Model Y back in December of 2020, which isn't even two years ago, it was really rare to see a Tesla driving around the Athens area. And now I can't go on a drive. Today we went up to Hurricane Shoals and did a little bit of sliding down this you know little river and stuff like that which was a lot of fun by the way if you happen to live in the commerce area it's really awesome but anyway as we were driving i think on the way there and back probably saw eight or ten teslas on the way there and back and this is in you know relatively rural georgia so we're not talking about atlanta we're not talking about los angeles we're not talking about new york we're not talking about these big cities where you expect to see these teslas this is just out on back roads in northeast georgia so that's how popular these things are getting and this 105% growth rate year over year just indicates that in a numeric fashion. And speaking of Tesla leading, here's something interesting. GM is offering U.S. Buick franchise dealers buyouts, and this is an article by John Critter, and this is news that I heard yesterday, and what I thought initially was, wait, GM still sells Buicks? I didn't even know that Buicks were being manufactured anymore. It's probably not a good sign that I don't see enough of them on the road to even notice the fact. But anyway, there are apparently about 2,000 Buick dealerships in the United States, and GM is offering any of them a buyout out if they're not interested in going to their new model, which I assume is probably going to be much more like what Tesla is doing in terms of direct sales to the consumer. It's probably going to make the dealership's importance far, far less in the process. Now, of course, global vice president here, Duncan Aldred, told the Wall Street Journal that shifting to EVs is going to require significant investments by Buick dealers. So that's the excuse. But I think the primary reason is that GM is trying to subtly get rid of as many dealerships as they possibly can because they're starting to see that these are albatrosses around their neck. They're not creating profitable situations. Consumers hate going to car dealerships. They would much rather buy a Tesla. In fact, honestly, even if the Tesla vehicle, and the Tesla vehicle is fantastic, it's the favorite car I've ever had by far, but even if the car was only just as good as every other car I've ever owned, I would still buy Tesla's exclusively in the future because of the dealership thing. And I know dealerships are like, oh no, we make the process easier and all this stuff. They do not. I hate going to dealerships. The whole haggling, the not knowing if you're getting a good deal, the not knowing how much you're going to walk out paying, the fact that they're asking you to do the underbody protection and yada, yada, yada. All of that kind of stuff is just a miserable experience and it takes hours and hours and even potentially days and days. Whereas Tesla, it's like, do, 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 do. You put down a couple hundred dollar deposit and you're done. So regardless of what 
GM is saying, I think that the real reason that they're trying to do this is to try to get rid of as many dealerships as possible to make their lives easier. Now, they did this last year with Cadillac dealerships, and my understanding was that about 384 of the Cadillac dealerships actually took the deal and stopped selling Cadillacs. And that, of course, allows GM a much straighter path in all of those areas to be able to sell direct to the consumer should they wish to in the future. So I think that that's what they're doing with the Buick dealerships, although obviously nobody is exactly saying. Certainly this is an interesting space to keep your eye on. And also I find it very interesting that GM, even though they're saying that Tesla is not the leader and that they're the leader, is following Tesla's lead, not just in going electric, but also it seems like in getting rid of dealerships as much as possible and trying to go with a more direct company to consumer model. And finally, another really good article by John Kreider. I will put the links to all of these in the description, obviously. This is an interview with Anna, who, as the title says, my Tesla saved our lives. She and her children were driving a 2018 Model Y in 2019 when a very bad accident with a BMW happened, and she believes that she and her children either could have been killed or very, very severely injured, if not for the fact that they were driving their Tesla Model 3. So I'm just going to cut to the details of the accident. I highly recommend reading the entire thing, obviously, but I just want to talk about this. So this is a quote from Anna. That was a Thursday afternoon, and the crazy thing is that people think accidents happen on the freeway or busy street. No, it was two miles away from my house at a quiet intersection. And by the by, most accidents happen within a couple of miles of your house, mostly because that's where you spend most of your time driving. Like literally every time you leave your driveway, you have to drive the couple of miles away from your house to go wherever you're going. So the odds are that accidents will happen near your house. Just an interesting thing. I think people do feel like accidents happen on freeways and stuff. They actually don't happen very frequently on freeways at all. They tend to be very serious, so when they happen, people take notice. But many more accidents happen on residential streets and side streets and smaller surface streets all over the area. So anyway, just a little interesting aside. Anyway, she said, I was hit by a Series 5 BMW. I think it was an older version, like early 2000s. The car was bigger than my Tesla Model 3. We then have a picture. You can see it was the rear door on the right-hand side or the passenger side in the United States. The impact caused her car to spin twice and crash into a wooden street pole that fell onto the roof over her Model 3. It was the glass roof that prevented the pole from fully penetrating the roof. Although it left a hole, the glass held. And if this part doesn't look too bad on the door, just look back here at the tire, right? Obviously, this was a very, very serious collision. And as Jonna points out, Tesla glass is actually a key safety feature in the design of the Tesla Model 3 and the Model Y. I was actually concerned about it when we bought the car because I was like, look at that gigantic glass up there. That can't be very structurally safe or anything. But then I did some research and it turns out it's amazingly safe. As Tesla says, safety is their number one priority. So clearly the glass roof, even though it's really, really cool, is also an incredibly strong structural member. And as Jonna wrote, this fact has been proven in multiple stories of accidents where miraculously the occupants in the car survived. Anna continues, I don't think we could have come out of the car to tell the story if it's not for how stable the Model 3 was. And that's in the spin because they got hit in the back and instead of flipping over with the heavy, heavy weight at the bottom of the car with the batteries, it's got a very low center of gravity. So it, what it did effectively, I guess, was spun a few times and then hit the light pole instead of flipping over, which would have been much more dangerous. And then the crux of the story, but also especially for my son, if it was not for how strong the roof of the car was, I don't think he would be here, Anna told me over the phone. And here, if we look at this picture, you can see completely smashed in on this side, obviously where the BMW hit it, but then you can see up here is where the light pole fell and there must have been a projecting piece out of it or something like that, that hit the glass roof. And you can see how it crushed it in, but it did not actually crush the glass roof. I assume that her son was probably sitting on the driver's side directly behind her, and that's why she was saying that. If the roof had been less strong and less stable, that thing would have, could have at least, come through and severely hurt or even potentially killed her son. So in short, Tesla's saying that safety is their number one priority is not just them talking. They have really, really high, in fact, the best safety ratings by NHTSA all over the place for all of their vehicles. And then when you see real world incidents like this, 
you realize anecdotally, obviously this is not statistics, but anecdotally you can see that these cars are built amazingly safely. Even if they're T-boned, this is the worst kind of accident you can get into. Being T-boned is, you know, being hit on the side, there's no protection on the side. And then something, a very, very heavy pole falling on the roof of the vehicle and not crushing it in. These things are just amazing testaments to how safe a Tesla is. Now, I don't ever want to get in an accident with my Tesla. And as Ashok Eloswamy said, and I will leave a link to this up in the description, hopefully in the future, Teslas will be uncrashable. They will basically drive themselves out of any potential crash situation. But anyway, in the meantime, crashes can happen. Weird stuff can happen. You know, tree branches can fall on your car or something. And they, I've seen that with Tesla Model 3s and Model Ys as well. And these cars survive this kind of damage. And that is amazing. And really kudos to Elon Musk and the entire team at Tesla for building such safe cars. It makes me and it makes my family feel much, much safer to drive in them. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it fun and thought-provoking and interesting. If you did, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. Also, I'm super happy to announce that my co-founder at Artomatic and I have started a new YouTube channel with a series called 5 Plus 5, where each of us has five minutes to explain a relevant topic on AI, machine learning, the latest in technology, digital art, etc. So anyway, please do check it out and please do subscribe so that the channel can grow relatively quickly. Quickly, we'd very much appreciate it. Thank you. A quick reminder that next weekend, September 10th and 11th, I will be in San Diego for the fully charged live show doing a panel with Lars from Best in Tesla and Brian from My Tesla Weekend. So if you're in the area, definitely come for the show and definitely come for our panel. There's a discount code in the description, so check it out. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much. Many of you were down for the scrubbed launch. I'm really, really sorry. And I'm sorry I wasn't there. Hopefully when we get to the October date, I will be able to go down with you and maybe I'll be the good luck charm and it will actually launch then. But anyway, I've really appreciated the boots on the ground information that's come from down there and of course the conversations that go on about all of this kind of stuff. And of course, if you want to join the team, just check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have Teslabot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.